Thanks. Thanks for joining today's lecture on farmers and the commodity futures. Today is the 15th lecture in this series, uh, which is titled Mapping Sustainable Agriculture. It is being hosted by India International Center. And today's speaker is Mr. Sanjay Mansabdar, who is a very experienced capital markets professional. Uh, he has traded in all asset classes ranging from commodities to foreign exchange to fixed income to derivatives and equities at banks, hedge funds, etc. He has set up and run several businesses in the capital markets and has been a consultant to NCDX and National Stock Exchange. He has also served on the investment committee of venture capital funds, uh, including the India Education Fund, among others. Uh, he has taught at the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore, uh, he's an alumni uh, of uh, IIT Bombay, from where he graduated, he took his B.Tech in Mechanical Engineering. Uh, not only that, he set up the e uh, company, uh, and in this company, he is working with FPOs and farmers across the states in the country. So he has seen it from both ends, that is the farmer's end, as well as the commodity exchange and, and future exchange end. Uh, in the last uh, one and a half years, uh, especially since June 2020, when the three ordinances were promulgated by the central government, there has been a lot of debate and discussion about the freeing up of agricultural trade. And there has been a feeling that uh, the government did a great job by freeing up the agricultural trade from the restrictive practices of APMCs and it will, it was thought that it is a transformative movement, transformative moment, which will help the farmers in discovering the prices in a much, much better way and they will be able to sell their commodity anywhere without any restrictions and there will be much better linkages between private sector buyers and the farmers. Somehow, um, the government has decided to repeal the laws, there have been pros, there have been cons, uh, and I'm sure that those of you who have been following this debate would have read both sides of the story and you have made up your mind uh, whether the farm laws were actually going to deliver the claims of the government or they were actually going to harm the farmers' vested interest as some farmers' unions have been claiming. So in today's lecture, Mr. Mansabdar will be covering uh, the issue relating to the the usefulness of commodity exchanges for farmers, why the farmers have not really been able to take advantage, why their participation is so low, whether there is any flaw in the design of the contracts, and what are the other implications for farmers. Uh, he will be speaking for about 30 to 35 minutes, maybe 40 minutes, and then we will have questions and answers for another uh, 15 or 20 minutes. We will finish today's session at five o'clock as we always do. Over to you, uh, Mr. Mansalta. Uh, thank you, Sri Hussain. Um, and many thanks to you, many thanks to IIC for this opportunity to um, present my thoughts on what an issue that is pretty dear to me as well. Um, I'll just uh, share my screen. I trust my presentation is visible. Yes, visible. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so as as uh, Sri Hussain mentioned, my focus will be on the on agricultural commodity futures and their use by farmers and FPOs. Um, I, this is a complex issue. Um, you know, it's not an easy one. And there are many issues that one can think about that have bearing on, on um, this specific topic. There are issues around contract design. There are issues around how to use it, uh, these contracts. There are issues, are regulatory issues uh, that, you know, and in the context of recent bans, uh, or, or as new contracts have not been launched on in some commodities, um, these are issues that have been bugbears for a while. And then there are economic issues in the sense that, look, there is there are concerns that do futures markets cause inflation and so on and so forth. So 
the the point I'm making is that really one has to. This is not an easy issue, and or an easy topic to discuss. And I will really look at it. My, my experience. Uh, I, I will be wearing three hats when I when I look at this issue. The first is as a markets practitioner, I, I, and I've spent many years uh, trading all kinds of markets around the world. Um, I have uh, I've done some academic work. Um, around around trying to understand derivative pricing in agricultural derivatives. I'll bring some of that uh, experience perhaps to bear here. And the third is in my in my in my role as a founder of an agri fintech. One of the things that I do is I work with farmers and FPOs across the country. And one of the services that we help them provide is essentially price hedging. And and uh, we work with them and we do suggest how they can use uh, exchange platforms and we do come across why they are not able to or unwilling to and so on and so forth and i will uh, i will bring those those i will wear those three hats as i talk through the, the issues here so keeping that in mind this is the agenda i'll follow uh, we'll review futures very quickly we'll review what are the accepted functions of futures markets we'll talk about hedging and how, uh, how what is the current use by fpos and farmers we'll talk about what is not visible, which is who takes the other side of the trade when farmers and FPOs participate and how it's important to make sure they're incentivized as well. Uh, we'll talk about a brief understanding of uh, ag uh, agri futures from a research perspective and then talk about a few issues like why is liquidity poor? Why, why do they not do well from a hedging perspective? Another question that is unresolved really, or a couple of questions that are unresolved is, are do futures cause inflation and um i'm sorry and just a, a quick uh, quick thought on the role of speculation are they necessary are they not what kinds of speculators etc let's talk about futures very quickly they are standardized exchange traded contracts uh, they represent a contract to purchase a fixed quantity of an underlying commodity of a certain quality at a fixed date in future which is the contract expiry date at, uh, there's a fixed quantity that is purchased uh, when you contract, you, you agree to buy a certain quantity, and then it's at the traded price at which the futures trade is done uh, with some small adjustments, but we won't get into that right now. Now, the traded price represents the market's expectation of spot prices at the in future, so on the contract expiry date. Um, in India, these are generally settled by delivery, and if when the contract expires, the short position holder at expiry is expected to deliver the underlying asset. Uh, typically, these you have multiple contracts available for many expirations, so one month to maturing in one month, maturing in two months, maturing in three months, and so on. But only the nearest two are typically liquid. Um, expiration is typically on the twentieth of the month, and there's a roughly every month new con a new contract is launched. Roughly, that's the that's the uh, launch cycle. Um, it's possible, so while only to, like, they're liquid for two, three months, it's possible to maintain positions for long periods by selling the contract you hold and rolling your position into the next contract. So let's say you wanted to keep a six month position um, from May to December or June to December. So at the end of June, you could roll into the July contract, sell the June contract before it expired and buy the July contract. And that way you could keep rolling your positions. An important feature is margins, or uh, and essentially this is how the exchange manages risk, so that any delivery that happens is good delivery. This, uh, this is really how the exchange uses uh, manages risk on its platform. Um, very quickly, uh, taking an example of a of a soybean contract, the underlying commodity is soybean. A contract expiry date. I have chosen the 20th Jan 22 contract as an example but you could have 20th Feb of 22, 20th March of 22, and so on and so forth. The underlying quantity is five metric tons. Uh, the basis center is indoor, which means that on uh, expiries, the uh, short position must deliver at indoor. There are also additional delivery centers. So the short position holder can also deliver at Akola, Latur, Mansour, and, and Kota. The quality of commodity that must be delivered is mentioned clearly. There is something called a tender period, which means that the short position holder can choose to start delivering from five days before 
20th. That, that's what the specification says. In minimum initial margin is 10%. I'll, sh I'll just talk about how that becomes or how that's relevant in a minute. Now, before we get into use of futures, what are the functions of futures? So if you look at traditional academic literature around the world, typically futures have served two functions in most markets. One is hedging effectiveness, i.e. they allow somebody to transfer risk to someone else, right? Um, somebody who wants risk can take it on. Somebody who wants to get rid of their underlying risk can therefore hedge uh, using futures markets. And therefore, hedging effectiveness is a key uh, key point of success for futures markets. They have to have good hedging effectiveness, otherwise they won't succeed. The second is price discovery. And this really pertains to is all information that is related to that commodity, how quickly is it incorporated into price? And Futures generally across the world are found to do very well at this compared to spot markets. In India, there has been an extreme focus on using the futures platform also as a delivery platform, and this is peculiar to India. So we've, uh, you know, considerable infrastructure has been set up to allow for delivery at multiple locations. And if I just go back to my previous slide, you can see that for the soybean contract, there's delivery at other centers also allowed, many other centers allowed. And this idea that, look, you can, we want delivery at many different places uh, is something that's fairly unique to India. This is not, this is not a feature of commodity markets globally. Let's look at what hedging is. Hedging is essentially risk reduction. As an example, let's take a farmer. In June, he expects to harvest 10, uh, so time is June. He expects to harvest 10 tons in October, but likes the current prices indicated by futures. So what are the things he can do? The first is a delivery based option. So what the farmer does is, so he has 10 tons. We discussed previously that each soybean contract, the contract size is five tons. So the farmer sells two futures contracts, two times five is uh, 10, so that's 10 tons. This is the price at 5,000 rupees per quintal. This is how futures are traded per quintal or quoted per quintal. So essentially, <laughs> now where does the margin come in? To take this trade, he has to pay an initial margin, which in this case would work out to rupees 50,000. This is what he has to place in order, he has to pay this in order to even take the trade. This is a crucial part uh, to understand. Now, what happens then? Now, he harvests in October and then delivers to the exchange on expiration. Now, what are the things he has to do to make sure that this trade completely goes through? First, he has to ensure that the deposit is as per the exchange requirements, which means specific quality. We, we talked about the quality specifications earlier. The tax has to be paid. There's things like Monday tax, et cetera, that needs to be paid. There's specific packaging that needs to be done for that commodity. So these are all parameters that the short seller or whoever's delivering must comply with. Now, if the expiration price were 8,000 rupees, assuming that in October, the price of soybeans went to 8,000. Then the, he will, since he has sold a contract at 5,000 and now the price is 8,000, he has lost 3,000 rupees on that trade. So in effect, he will pay the exchange 3,000 and this happens over, as the price is rising, not on the expiry date, yeah? So if the day that the price went from 5,000 to 5,500, he lost 500 rupees, he needs to pay to the exchange in order to make sure that he can maintain his position. And this is just how exchanges manage their uh, risk. In effect, um, he will have to pay 3,000 rupees to the exchange, but he will be able to sell his soybeans at 8,000 rupees uh, from to the exchange itself. So the net price is 5,000 and there is a small delivery cost of packaging and so on and so forth. So his net price is 5,000 minus delivery. Now. Keep in mind, as I said, the total margin paid because of this 3,000 rupee loss is almost 3 lakhs of rupees in addition to the 50,000 rupees of initial margin that had to be paid. So in order to keep this hedge for three months, the farmer has had to pay 3.5 lakhs of rupees, right? Uh, and this is before he has received anything from harvest, yeah? So this is a crucial point. Now, in the first case, we assumed that the price went up. What happens if the price goes down? If it goes down to 3,000 rupees, he receives 2,000 from the exchange, but he's able to sell the soybeans only at 3,000, but the net price still remains this 2,000 he received plus the 3,000, that's 5,000 minus whatever it cost him to deliver. 
This is hedging. Basically, no matter what happened, he gets a price of 5,000, no matter whether prices go up or go down. This was the first way of hedging. What's the second way of hedging? This, the first way assumed that the farmer was able to deliver. What if the farmer was not able to deliver? In that case, he could essentially sell longer date, not the October, but the uh, November future at 5,200 in July. That's when he liked the prices. And in October, he buys back his futures position uh, at whatever is the futures price at that point in time. And his net, uh, and then whatever his soybean that he has harvested, he can sell in the spot market in October at whatever the price is. Now, effectively, whatever the, the net selling price for the farmer will be 5,200 minus the futures price in October. This term in brackets is really what the farmer has made or lost from the futures trade, plus the spot price. Now, if in October the futures price was 3,200, then in effect, what he will get is the spot price plus uh, rupees 2,000. If it's 8,000, uh, 500 it's spot price minus uh, 3000 which if you if you substitute for the spot price you will see that in both cases it still works out to the same price either way this is the second way of hedging the third way to think about hedging is let's say because everybody knows that in october lots of farmers and fpos will be selling there's lots of supply which basically means that the price is going to be depressed everyone knows this so what the farmer could do is that rather than sell in um, October, he takes his uh, harvest, stores it, and then sells it in uh, in later months, again using futures. So sells the futures that, uh, that expire in maybe January or February rather than October, and essentially delivers into those futures, same as what we discussed in option one. Now, this is another third strategy. However, what's important to understand is that this requires access to credit because typically a farmer has borrowed in order to have uh, borrowed for inputs, borrowed for fertilizer, whatever it is, in order to be able to create the harvest. So as a result, credit access is needed for this option three. Now, before we get into more details, a quick question to ask is who takes these? So it's all very well for the, to say that the farmer will sell futures. And in all three options, he's selling futures that I talked about to hedge. However, who's taking the other side? I mean, you know, the farmer is going to harvest two times a year, but yet we want a market that's liquid across the year, right? How, who's going to take the other side? Futures at the end are a zero-sum game. Every contract, there is a buyer and a seller. If the farmer gains, somebody else loses and vice versa. If everybody knows that the farmer is going to be selling at harvest, who's going to be buying? Who's going to be taking the other side of the contract? And really what happens, and this is where I wear my market hat, the people who are interested in taking the other side of that trade are long hedgers, like maybe a processor. So a soybean processor who wants regular supplies through the year. He is somebody who's interested in buying and taking delivery, uh, not just in October, but also through the year. So he's always available to, to take the other side of the trade. Then there are speculators who are betting, who may bet that depressed prices around harvest will recover after the harvest because as the supply disappears. These are the two types of, typically the two types of players who, who would participate. And it's really important for the exchange ecosystem, for regulators to ensure the participation of these entities. Otherwise, the market will not be liquid. And we'll come back to this point in, when we discuss liquidity a little bit uh, uh, in in future. So what is where do we stand with respect to FPOs and farmers or rather FPOs and farmers using futures? So farmers using FPOs is uh, difficult and I'll come to that for the reasons for that in a few seconds. But a simple answer, there are two really simple answers to that. The first one is the margins. Remember I talked about margins. To take on a trade, you need to put up that 50,000 rupees. And if they, the trade goes against you, you have to put up the losses as well. Where is the farmer going to get that money from? We know that it's, uh, you know, even basic credit is hard enough for the farmer. To get credit of this nature, it's going to be difficult. The second reason is that the contract sizes are too large for the average farmer in the country to participate. So um, in, in soybeans, we talked about each contract being five tons. And if it is five tons, that's a lot for each, for the average farmer. He doesn't produce that much. So to that extent, for him to use futures is difficult. So a, a more 
an, an alternate is for FPOs, which are aggregates of farmers to use futures instead. And there has been some activity on that front. About 40 FPOs are using futures markets for hedging programs. There are many more who've done single trades only. Um, there are reports of about up to 15% improvement in realizations for successful programs. However, we must understand that this is likely for the trades that have won. Remember, there are three, I talked about the three different ways of hedging. And it's possible to lose money also in hedging, and we'll come to that in a minute. But there's no information about FPOs who have lost money in hedges, uh, in putting on these hedges either. And I'm pretty sure that there are some out there. Um, majority of the trade has happened in soybean, the Guar complex, maize, and chana. The FPOs generally have been located in Gujarat, MP, Maharashtra, Rajasthan. Approximately 90,000 metric tons has been traded, of which about 12,000 tons has been delivered by FPOs over the last five years or so. And these are pretty tiny numbers relative to what the underlying farmers can produce. And it's well worth asking why this is the case. <laughs> Let's, I would, this, what I've got here is from, uh, I'm wearing all my three hats at the same time and trying to put together a list of the issues. And then we'll try and understand some of those issues uh, or each, some of those in a little more detail. First, liquidity is poor. So if you try to get a large volume done, it's just not possible. You will move you will move the market against yourself. And this is an important point, and it's applicable for all three options of hedging that I talked about earlier. The second is initial margins to be paid. Um, again, applicable for all three methods of hedging. Um, the problem here is that FPOs are not uh, entities that have a lot of capital. They, their capital is limited. So to put up a large chunk of capital in order to put on a trade is difficult for them. Um, it's there, there are many, um, the, the capital itself may not be available in order to do that uh, as, as it stands today. Um, I talked about the three lakh margins, that's called a mark to market margin in case the trade loses. And if it does lose, then essentially the FPO has to pay even more money even before it receives the realization on account of sales of proceeds. So there's a cash flow mismatch. So how does the FPO uh, find that money? Where do they find it from in order to pay, pay this up? Obviously, FPOs have a board and have many decision makers, and all of them have to be on board. Many of them have to be on board if the FPO is to engage in a hedging program. This is not an easy topic. At the end of the day, I explained three methods of hedging. Um, or, you know, it's not an easy thing to convince so many people that, look, this is a program that's going to help you. And like I said, in some cases, particularly option two, it's possible to lose money on those hedges as well. So these are things that there is a healthy, there is an aversion to from uh, board members of, of FPOs. Um, one of the other issues is that the exchange needs to maintain some quality parameters, which are pretty strict. So what happens to an FPO? When an FPO tries to deliver, they need to make sure that the quality of delivery matches up with that specification. In the event that the quality doesn't match up to that specification, two things happen. One, they've not been able to sell, number one, right? They've, they wanted to deliver their uh, commodity. They've not been able to do it. The second is that the trade is, is, is there's, the trade is said to be have defaulted because the delivery hasn't happened. And there are penalties to be paid for that. So that becomes an additional loss for the FPO. In addition, the FPO has, if, may have done packaging, may have done assaying in order to make sure that uh, the delivery is as per the standards of the exchange. What happens to that cost? All of that goes waste if it goes in bad delivery. So these are some of the fears that uh, FPOs have and therefore have a, at the back of their minds, these are things that they need, they need to comfort on before they're able to use the platform. Basis risk. Um, this is really base. The basis is essentially defined as spot minus futures. The spot price. So if I'm in, in let's say I'm in Indore, then the spot price in Indore minus the futures price. That is the basis from my perspective. <coughs> this is um, so basis predictability is the key for hedging. And I like you know we can we can go into a discussion. I don't you know I don't have the time to get into too much of detail around this, but for the time being, um, one of the things that I will state as a, as a user of futures markets, as, as a market practitioner, 
is that the predictability of the basis is absolutely crucial if the future is to be useful from a hedging perspective. Um, if the basis risk is too high, then some short hedgers, which is farmers FPOs, and almost all long hedgers, which is people who want to who are to take the other side from a hedging perspective, like a processor, they will not participate because ultimately what they want, the futures does not track the price that is relevant to them. And that's what happens. If the basis risk is high, that's what happens. The future doesn't become useful to them. Uh, continuing with some of the, we'll talk about those issues in red, which is liquidity and basis risk in a little more detail, because these are important issues, not just for farmers, but for any market. Um, there are other issues also faced by farmers. One, we've seen that participation picks up when some incentives are provided. As I said, you know, uh, the FPO faces costs in actually delivering uh, to the exchange. If as in when and there are margin, uh, there are margins they need to pay. If some of these are defrayed, we've seen that participation picks up. I talked about contract sizes being too large for most farmers. Uh, another issue is that farmers are not liable to pay taxes, and to the ex to that extent, uh, invoicing becomes difficult for them because any delivery made on the exchange platform must have all taxes paid. Uh, so this is another issue that that stops um, farmers from participating. Options are actually the ideal instrument. However, liquidity is even poorer than futures. I won't go into why, but uh, that is the state as it stands right now. Let's now just spend a few minutes trying to understand what is the academic, from an academic perspective, what is the understanding of uh, Indian agricultural commodity futures? Now, the hedging effectiveness, as I said, this is one of the key features of futures markets is found to be extremely poor. And there are many, many studies which have uh, validated this. Second uh, understanding as of today is that futures lead in price discovery compared to spot markets, i.e. they are good at incorporating all price information. And therefore the fair price is better known in futures as compared to spot. This is what the current understanding is. The third understanding as in, in the literature as it stands today, is that futures, the backwardation in futures is abnormal, which means that futures trade below the spot. So in the soybean case, the price of futures in soybeans is below the spot market price in Indore most of the time, much more than expected. And this is abnormal. Um, this is a current uh, situation of Indian commodity markets. The fourth understanding of Indian commodity markets is that they are inefficient. And again, there are multiple studies that, that show this which basically means that futures prices cannot predict spot prices in future wealth. Yeah, so these are the, this is the current state of understanding. In the last few years, there is new research, which I have had the good fortune to be part of, which has focused on another area, which is contract design, which is due to, due to embedded op location options. So when I showed you the specification for soybean, I, show, I mentioned to you that in addition to Indore, the short seller can also deliver at uh, four other locations. This, is, this has been put in place largely to serve the delivery function, which is unique to India. Uh, in allow larger groups of uh, participants to use the exchange platform for delivery. However, introduction of this feature has several impacts. Now, what is the impact? First, it leads to enormous complexity as, as the futures contract is no longer just a future. It's a future plus an option. And a, a markets professional like me finds it really difficult to value something like this. Uh, it would almost be impossible for an FPO or a farmer to be able to figure out its fair value. Um, it is also, this also leads to ex excessive backwardation. And this is exactly what is seen in Indian commodity futures. Such, a, such features also cause poor hedging effectiveness. That's also seen and is, therefore this is able to account for why hedging effectiveness of Indian agricultural commodities is poor. And finally, the last insight that this new research gives is that if the current price discovery research does not account for the presence of this option, now if you account for the presence of this option, 
uh, the research has found that actually spot markets are better at predicting, uh, I'm sorry, at incorporating price information as compared to futures markets. And no wonder people are going to spot markets and then not using futures markets. Uh, there's absolutely no wonder if that's what is actually happening. So how we talked about the functions of futures markets a little bit earlier. So how are futures doing relative to those three functions? And if you look at what uh, the, the evidence that I just, academic evidence that I just presented, what's happening is that in trying to support the secondary function, which is unique to India, that is delivery, futures are failing in their primary functions, which is risk transfer and price discovery. This is what is happening. This is an inherent conflict. And to my mind, this is something that must be addressed before futures can really start to provide a vehicle for FPOs, farmers, other participants to actually be able to, um, they must do well at their primary functions before we can even start to think about their usage uh, by farmers and FPOs. This is just a quick uh, graph to show what's happened really in India with respect to uh, volumes of agri futures. And you can see that um, we are actually perhaps even lower than 2008 as it stands today, whereas you know most other international markets have generally done well. Um, this is a confluence of not just you know contract design, of course, things like bans, things like uh, you know if you if you don't allow contracts to be issued, this is going to happen, and we'll talk about try and understand some of those points now. So first, why is liquidity poor? Why are volumes so bad? Why have they been falling? I talked about long hedgers, the processors. They are the ones for who basis risk matters the most. And I, I showed you why the contract design as it stands today, which allows for uh, location options, makes it, essentially it increases basis risk enormously. And therefore hedging trades are more likely to lose. If that's what the case, why will somebody hedge? So it's easier for us if, if the hedging performance of futures is bad, it is actually more risky for the the hedged position is riskier than the open position. So most hedgers say, you know what, I'll just find some other way to hedge. And they typically do it in, in pricing such that they add a, such a large margin that any fluctuations in the underlying price are accounted for. That's one way of doing it. Um, now, if you want to have a hedging program in place, which means you do it on an ongoing basis, you need some guarantee that the futures contracts will always be available for such hedging programs, right? If one fine day those futures contracts are not available because of bans, uh, then really uh, such hedging programs become absolutely unpredictable for all kinds of hedges. So this is another big issue why liquidity is poor because people just don't have long-term programs in place given the unpredictability. Um, some categories of participants with exposure are not allowed, like banks, for example. So you're effectively saying a whole bunch of participants who could use markets are just not allowed to participate. Speculators is another, another really large set of uh, important players in any market. However, in this market, speculation is considered to be a dirty word. It's not encouraged. And you, know, you, you have to walk into a speculator's office to see how they're structured. You know, there are rows and rows and rows of thousands of desks of people, or not thousands, hundreds of people actually trading these markets. And speculation is a business. So suddenly, if you decide to ban contracts, then in effect, you're taking away business from for people and they will not participate. Um, similarly, if long side margins are increased uh, to dis discourage long speculation, and these are the only kind of speculators for who basis risk does not matter that much. Um, essentially, you, you, you know, those long speculators also stop participating if these margins are frequently increased. As uh, some of these positions then get forced out regulatorily. Um, many exchange members have surrendered membership, and therefore you can see why uh, volumes would have fallen as they have. Um, long story short, trading in agricultural commodity futures is not a predictable business, either from a hedging perspective or from a speculator's perspective in this environment. Second question to ask, why is basis risk high? Right? And we talked about one reason, which is the second reason here, which is that futures allow for multiple delivery locations. Um, and what happens in that situation, it's like the, there are a few others. The first is that spot markets themselves are subject to state intervention. 
So if there's suddenly an intervention in, a, in one particular spot market, we talked about the five deliverable spot markets, right? If there's suddenly one intervention in one of those markets or in one state, then obviously the basis is going to change completely, very quickly. Um, I talked about the multiple delivery locations and the option that it en envisages. The way that works is that the least price market essentially drives the futures contract in that case. Regardless of whether that least price market is the is a small market or a large market, it doesn't matter. So in a sense, it's the you could have a situation of the tail wagging the dog, and this could cause futures prices to fluctuate wildly. Um, and there is research to show how that works. Finally, the, in most international markets, there is a lot of inventory data, and what the basis is supposed to represent is really inventory. How much are stocks of the commodity are available? In India, this, this data is not available. It's generally a lot of storage is private and therefore opaque. And therefore, with no information, what happens to the basis is an extremely unpredictable affair. Um, I just wanted to visually show you how hedging, you know, how the basis needs to function if a contract is useful from a hedging perspective. So on the y-axis, I have prices and red, red graph pertains to futures, the green graph pertains to spot. Uh, and remember I said that the basis is defined as spot minus futures, and therefore you see that the blue line below is the actual basis. You can see that prices go up, prices go down, the basis remains fairly predictable, right? And these kinds of contracts are useful from a hedging perspective. Uh, if they are to be used by hedgers. This is what happens if you have unpredictable options like the ones that, that are embedded in Indian agri futures. So again, you can see that the futures the, starts to fluctuate wildly, yeah, very wildly. And what ultimately happens is that the basis is no longer predictable. When the basis behaves like this, it's impossible to use the futures market from a hedging perspective. This is what is happening because of the embedded location options. And this is rendering enormous basis risk into the contract, which is why participants are saying we can't really use this. Let's answer another question. Uh, do futures cause inflation? Because this is one that, um, that many people ask. It's unresolved. All, you know, I, I don't have a definitive answer one way or the other. I can just provide some uh, interpretations. There are many ways of phrasing this question. The first way of phrasing this is, can speculators drive up prices of futures markets? Academic research is mixed on this. Many, there are many who say that, yes, it can. There are others who say, that, you know, it, it doesn't. However, speaking, you know, wearing my hat of a market practitioner, I can tell you that if a wall of money hits, you know, so if you take the case of commodity index investors, what they want is basically commodities exposure. I don't, you know, I. I will buy what is called an index and what that happens is they buy the index, but that causes the underlying futures to be bought. Now, if the only buyers and no sellers, obviously the futures market is going to go up, right? And this is what has happened in market after market after market. Um, there, I can give you so many examples, you know, uh, across the world that there is really no doubt in my mind that this does happen, whether we can prove it in academically or not. It's been proven in some cases. In other cases, there's research to show it actually doesn't do anything. But I, you know, just from a, from a market practitioner's perspective, uh, this is something that happens all the time. Second, rephrasing the question slightly differently. Can futures Granger cost spot prices? And this is really a hard academic interpretation. It, it's, it's a little bit short-sighted, but this is the hard academic interpretation of that question. Um, again, the evidence is mixed. The Abhijit Sen committee, a couple of RBI reports, there are others who've tried to do this from an econometric perspective. However, the evidence is mixed. Sometimes futures drive spot, sometimes spot drives futures for different commodity. Sometimes it's bi-directional. So really there's no answer if you were to look at it from this hard academic hat. Um, the last, uh, or the third way of rephrasing this question, um, which is slightly less understood, but futures also have a signaling effect, which means that essentially the very idea that, hey, futures prices are going up, leads some participants to believe that the underlying demand supply 
Um, this may be, so these prices could go up for two reasons. They could either go up because speculators are buying or it could go up because of real economic activity. How is somebody to distinguish? How are people to distinguish? And it's really hard to do that. Um, uh, you, there's a lot more research that needs to get done uh, to, to come to a definitive understanding of is this because of speculation or is this because of uh, economic activity? And we all know about, you know, Greenspan, for instance, who said that, look, uh, you can't predict uh, bubbles in advance and so on and so forth. So those are well-known incidents. Uh, but if the signaling, if futures go up uh, and that activity causes people to believe that, hey, this is indicative of underlying economic, economic activity, then sure, there can be bouts of inflation and there is research to show how this has actually happened. I'll come to one last question. Uh, is speculation dirty? Because this is something that, you know, always comes up in discussions of these kinds. I, again, from my, uh, from the varied hats that I wear, these, these are some insights. First, speculators are key participants. They need to be a part of any market and they add to all year round liquidity. If we tell speculators, you know what, just come to markets when farmers and FPOs are selling and then don't participate otherwise, um, it's not a reasonable expectation, right? They need to make money off it. They need to be, a, they need something where they, they can treat it as a sustainable activity. So they are key participants if one wants a futures market. Second, there is considerable evidence to show that futures reduces volatility, but I also showed you some evidence that shows that speculation causes bubbles. How does one reconcile this? Honestly, the only way to look at this is to say that not all speculation is the same. There are there's some type of speculation, and typically it's called you know arbitrage, or and that really is very beneficial because it reduces volatility, it brings about efficiency in markets. However, there is evidence, and I already talked about if a wall of money hits futures, of course they are going to go up. How does one deal with this? Actually, a coordinated scalpel style effort is needed to control speculation or to limit speculation. Um, not a, you know, you can't take a hammer approach, a very blunt one, like ban everything or like market-wide margin increases. These are all hammer blows, which will kill the market, not, uh, not create a situation where it is controlled within the limits of the market, which is what is needed. What can be done? There are, you know, as I, as you would appreciate by now that there are many issues here. It is not a straightforward, uh, simple thing. There are many, many things that need to be done in order to make, create a market where FPOs and farmers can actively participate to reduce their price risk. Um, some suggestions are, and not all, not all of, some of these are unique. Some have been talked about in many other, uh, in many other articles and forums. First is a futures market requires a good spot market. So you do need consistency of regulation between the two. The second is the, the contract design needs to be sensibly done so that basis risk is re reduced. Third, bans just not okay from a futures markets perspective. Fourth, incentives for FPOs should be provided while they build the necessary knowledge, the necessary capital to participate. This could take the form of margin, uh, margin support uh, or alternate sales in case of bad delivery and so on and so forth. And the experience has been that when incentives are provided, participation does pick up. Then finally, all important is capacity building, which is really how do you get farmers and futures to uh, farmers and FPOs to understand that, look, futures can actually be used. And this is a big gap as it stands today. Um, I'll stop there. I'm happy to answer any uh, any questions that I can shed some light on. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mansabdar. It is a very complex subject. And I'm very happy that you have made it as simple as, as it was possible. So. Um, I will be asking you a couple of questions and then we will see how it goes and uh, whether the audience has any questions. So my first question is, uh, how aware are the farmers uh, about the hedging opportunities and whether they see any benefit? Your organization, eDwara, has been working with FPOs in several states. What have you found on the ground? <clears throat> Um, so there, 
there are two, three, I would say there are two, three um, points of awareness. Let me put it like that. The first, there is some understanding on the ground that there is this animal called futures, which does tell me some estimate of what the price may be in on expiration, right? Some idea it's giving me. And there are farmers who do use those prices. So we ourselves disseminate prices uh, of Monday prices, futures prices, to keep many FPOs and farmers and FPOs involved. And they do use those prices to make some decisions, such as sowing decisions. What should I sow? Because, okay, at, if soybeans is giving me this price at the end of three months as compared to maize, I might be better off so doing soybeans instead. So these are questions that uh, to, to which uh, FPOs and farmers are using prices as an indicator to guide their actions. That, that is happening. Um, taking it a step further to use it for actual hedging, very, very small proportion. I mean, uh, it, it is quite difficult to get a single FPO to participate today. And I've already listed some of the issues, right? Like I said, um, the capacity, they don't have, the board of directors who's empowered to make this decision on behalf of FPOs, they're scared. Uh, what happens in the event that you know, bad delivery occurs? What happens if there are margins? If uh, if I suddenly have three lakh margin and my entire capital is eight lakhs of rupees, I'm not going to be able to pay those margins, right? So I'd rather not participate. This is the standard answer that we get. Um, a third is okay. There are some who've done single trades, um, maybe made some money and lost some money a little bit, but they're not. If they lose money, they're not prepared to explore it further at all. This is a sort of third experience that we have. Um, Lastly, it is a real job to get them to see what are the various things that they need to take into account when they have to actually use the exchange platform and they come to us and say, look, we'd rather not do so many things. It's, it's beyond our control. Uh, did I answer the question? Yes, yes, you have. So the basic point is, and it keeps coming all the time between those who think that market can provide a solution to MSP and those who think that markets are not adequate instruments. So that is what I was trying to explore. Um, another thing is, uh, in your experience, do you think that uh, farmers of certain commodities have a better understanding than the farmers of other commodities? Because it seems that in Rajasthan, uh, many farmers have been engaged in dabba trading for menthol and other things so what what does it say so that's a wonderful question because honestly uh, so let me take two states let me take rajasthan and let me take maharashtra right our experience in these two states typically if you look at land land parcel sizes they are larger in rajasthan as compared to maharashtra they're generally larger maharashtra is pretty small but uh, rajasthan is generally much larger the farmers therefore have much larger quantities to trade and therefore explore many more means of maximizing this this quantity that they have they can actually start to you know it is a meaningful quantity for many of them whereas in maharashtra it's not even enough to do one contract right in many cases so to that extent there is definitely more understanding in i would say if i take these two states in rajasthan as compared to maharashtra um, i suspect you know, that also, so the, that's the underlying reason, in my opinion. However, uh, because they're used to growing, you know, specific kinds of commodities, one can all, it becomes a commodity specific thing as a uh, byproduct. The real underlying issue is what's the underlying land size? What is the underlying, uh, what, what is the minimum quantity? Is that quantity large enough to justify alternate means of uh, maximizing their return from it? That's the underlying issue. Now, another question which keeps coming all the time in the ministries in the government of India is, uh, what is the relationship between inflation and commodity futures? And whenever the prices tend to go up, the officers in the ministry uh, somehow think that it is linked to futures and, and some stakeholder or the other uh, gives representations to the ministries that, you know, because of the futures trading, the prices are going up. So if we take the current current example of soybean prices, which are, uh, you know, ruling around 6,000 rupees per quintal against the MSP of 3,950 rupees, 
So the the uh, soybean processors association, for example, uh, is maybe blaming the futures market for uh, this kind of uh, higher prices. And in the ministries, uh, I must confess the uh, understanding is not as deep. So um, in this situation, how do how do you think the government should proceed? Because there is no clear evidence. The Abhijit Sen committee also came to a conclusion, um, even though they gave other points of view also that there is no direct relationship. So um, you also covered this in your presentation, but uh, you also suggested you know both sides. So how does how does the government decide what to do? A great question, and honestly, it I, it is an unenviable position for the government. The right answer to you know, or a direction to the right answer really would be, as I said, you can't do uh, you can't do hammer blows, right? You really have to get into the underlying understanding what's happening uh, at at the ground level. Now, if you take the example that you took, which is price of soybeans today, one of the reasons is that there has been rain damage to crops, right? That has been one of the primary reasons today. Now, can one say this at every point in time? Maybe not. There are situations. So, for example, I showed in my presentation the spike in commodities that happened in uh, 2010. This was not uh, confined to India alone. This was a phenomenon all over the world, right? And this was clearly driven by what is known as or what is now understood as financialization of commodities, right? A wall of money just hitting commodity futures or commodities in general and commodities uh, going up, including Indian agri commodity futures. That, of course, is a different kettle of fish. So long story short, very it's not an easy one, right? It's not an easy answer. The ministry is in an unvi unenviable position. But what I will say is that the answer is multidimensional. Yeah, and one needs to look at each of those dimensions and fix each of these. So I talked about contract design. This is something that's easily fixable. Uh, the laws had, I thought, gone some way in fixing some of the regulatory issues that also, you know, have implications for futures. Uh, but having now that they they've been repealed, uh, I'm not sure how those things can be done easily. But it is something that that is relatively a lower hanging fruit as compared to saying, you know ban all futures or ban all speculators and you know speculation is a bad word that taking an approach like that certainly will not help it is a fine it's it's some policy some fine tuning of that policy understanding issue by issue and some smart regulation that will fix this because it is a complex issue as my presentation will have shown okay thank you now another question is whether the futures markets can predict the future prices in an for an article which i wrote i think in april this year i tracked the future prices of soybean as reflected in october november december january february march so in all these months the future prices uh, you know for the next 6 months were in the range of uh, 6000 you know around msp or only slightly more than the msp and by the time we came to april you know, the spot prices had gone so high, touching 6,000, uh, 7,000 and so on. So, which means that the future um, futures failed to anticipate what really happened to the soybean prices. So, in this situation, if I was a farmer, I would not have, uh, you know, even the future prices would not have shown that uh, I may realize 6,000 rupees per quintal for my soybean. So, what do you think? Why the futures were not able to predict uh, correctly or or even remotely correctly? Sure. Uh, again, you know, great questions. Um, two, three, two, three um, viewpoints really there, right? The first one is one to do with. Let, let's take the situation now. The fact that you had unseasonal rains which caused damage is information that came by only in October, right? September, October is when that information was available. Before that, that information wasn't available. So in June, July, this is not something that the futures could have done at all, right? Uh, it's just inf it's new information that has been incorporated. But it's been if it's been incorporated into both spot and futures after the information became publicly known or known to everybody, right? And it, 
it is public information. Luckily, rainfall is not a is not private information, but that's one uh, one of the reasons. Right in that situation, futures can't do it. Right, it's not possible to say, look, what what will happen to? Will there be rains for sure? Will there not be rains for sure? That nobody knows. All said and done. So to expect futures to do that is not realistic. What the way it gets reflected, this kind, what what this is telling us is that there is enormous amounts of uncertainty, yeah, and that uncertainty typically gets reflected in option prices, not in futures prices. Now, options are the ideal instrument for farmers, but you know that is another ball game entirely in terms of how to create a liquid options market. So I won't go there. But long story short, some information cannot be futures cannot be expected to price in this information. Unless it, it 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 is you know known in that sense, that's one part. Second part of the question is okay. This is a one-time thing, but if you were to look at it over a long period, yeah, you, over years, have futures been able to predict spot price forward spot prices? Answer is no. There are so many studies that have said that Indian futures markets are very inefficient and are unable to predict those spot prices. Um, so again, I'm sorry to give you a. Uh, two-sided answer, but that is how it is. No, no, it is good. It is good. Uh, you have referred to certain studies which show that futures uh, market cannot correctly predict these spot prices. Actually, I was talking of soybean crop of last year, which was not impacted by rains. So, right. yeah, so, sorry. so last year the futures market failed. And lastly, my last question is that now the the economists and and those who believe in the markets. You know, argue that options is like insurance, and therefore farmers should buy, you know, call option and all that. So, first of all, uh, I think um, you know it is too complex. And secondly, who will buy on the other side? Supposing you know, uh, hundred thousand farmers of soya bean want to buy uh, call option. Uh, who will buy the put option? So again, excellent question, and the. Taking from my experience in other developed markets, the way it works is you don't need somebody to to buy the well. You do need somebody to buy the option, but you don't have to do a one for one match. You understand? What is needed for a liquid options market is the ability to manage an options position well, which means that you need access to the underlying both buy and sell. So, I, if if I if you ask me tomorrow to manage a option or even a put option that I have sold to a farm. Let's say I'm a dealer. I have sold a put option to a farmer to manage my risk. I need to be able to buy and sell the underlying commodity. Even when I don't own it, I need short selling capability, right? Um, this is just not available in this country, right? Um, in our market structure context, this ability to manage options is just not there. So, um, and if one wants, so it's not necessary to find an exact one for one match of, of uh, you know, there is a long hedger and there is a short hedger and they need exactly opposite option. But you don't need that, right? There are dealers who can take that position, but they need to be able to manage the risk. Uh, however, to manage that risk has some prerequisites. Those prerequisites don't exist as of today. And if options are to become relevant in this country, uh, policymakers, regulators must focus on creating those a creating those prerequisites. B allowing such option uh, hedging and such option uh, management to actually take place. Things like short selling, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Good, good. Thank you. So, um, friends, those who have joined uh, on YouTube and those who have joined through the uh, registration link of India International Center, thank you for following this discussion. I am sure you have. Um, seen the complexity of the futures market and and whether in the near term uh, India can hope to provide security of prices to our farmers through the futures market. Now, one last thing I would like to say before we conclude is that there is a need to train the IAS officers and perhaps the officers of other civil services in the use of the future contracts, options contracts, the experience of other countries, and how uh, more processors and buyers, etc., can be persuaded or can be, uh, you know, it, it can be made attractive for them to use the futures market for their business 
export or whatever, um, because the understanding within the government has to be substantially better than what it is today, so that ad hoc decisions are not taken. From time to time, we have seen uh, restrictions on future trading, restrictions on stock limits, etc. The you know, amendment in the Essential Commodities Act uh, was basically targeted at reducing such discretion on the part of the government, but somehow the events of the last one year have shown that India's surpluses in most agricultural commodities are so small that the space available to the government for managing the prices is not very large. And therefore, the government itself had to use Essential Commodities Act. So with this, we come to an end of today's session. Thank you very much, participants, for joining today's lecture. I'm sure that Mr. Mansabdar's Mansabdar made an excellent presentation. He simplified very complex um, definitions of futures markets, and I'm sure um, if you have found this discussion interesting, you can write to me or you can write to India International Center, and we can perhaps have another discussion on this platform or some other platform. Thank you very much, Mr. Mansabtar. Thank you, India International Center, for hosting this series uh, of lectures on sustainable agriculture. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it.